Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, feels like winter out after it was summer last week, typical New England. Um, you know, a lot's happened since we met last. Obviously, we've gone through the election season. We have a new president-elect. And regardless of who you supported in that process, I think it's what we are hoping to be a part of is really moving forward. Um, as a country and as as communities. So we'll be looking at a lot of those issues in the next few months. Um, I also obviously want to acknowledge just this week, Veterans Day, um, you know, thanking everybody for the, all the veterans for their service and their sacrifices, as well as their families. And I want to begin this morning just talking a little bit about this task force. And I know some of you, as I look at the names, some of you have been with us since the very beginning. But this task force actively began meeting after its launch in August of 2020. And we've used those meetings to have presentations from law enforcement, civil rights advocates, community leaders, experts in the fields of racial justice, immigration, and social equity. And that range of presentations, I hope, has helped to educate, inform, and inspire, really, um, task force members and the community to address hate-related incidents and promote inclusivity. You know, as <clears> I say all the time, I consider part of my job being that we are always reducing the number of people um, who live in this big county who wonder, do I belong here? Of our 1.8 million people, we know one in five were born somewhere other than the United States, and one in four speak a language other than English as their primary language at home. And partly because of your help with this and the work we've been able to do, I'm really proud today to announce that our office has been awarded a three-year grant from the Urban Institute's Justice Policy Center. And this project is aimed at evaluating the development and the implementation of hate crime task forces across the United States. And the focus is on improving the reporting of crimes. As you know, we've gone through lots of iterations, um, QR codes and forms and lots of ways to make sure we're actually getting the information. Um, and then also addressing the needs of survivors and victims in those cases. So before we transition to the three great speakers we have this morning on today's topic, I wanna turn it over to Antonia Thompson for a couple of minutes to just give us an update about the grant. So, Antonia. Yes, good morning, thank you. Um, and I just wanna echo what DA Ryan just said about your participation on our task force. We have grown over the last several years, and I think it's a true testament to the work that we're all doing as stakeholders in our, our surrounding communities. The goal of the, the grant, and we were very lucky, we're one of seven cohorts across the country that was chosen to participate over these three years. Um, and one of the reasons was because we started um, a couple years back as a small group and now have grown to a, a task force. The goal is to figure out what are the best practices of having a hate crime task force with a, with a specific goal of looking at how do we create wraparound services for survivors and victims of hate crimes? How do we make sure that when these task force comes together, their goal and mission has data tied to it at the end to make sure that we are kind of all on the same page and that we're able to report accurately on these incidents that are happening. So over the next couple of years, you will see the Urban Institute, they might step in on some of our meetings. Um, at certain points, they will know um, our members. They might reach out to you to ask feedback and input of how you feel as a task force member of the work that we're doing. Um, so I will give a heads up to everyone as that happens, and I will send more information out as to um, those different benchmarks that we need to meet over the grant. But we just wanted to make everyone um, aware that over the next probably two years, we'll be reaching out to you just to get your feedback as how we can improve the task force. There was just recently a question about what is the impact of the work that we do in these meetings. And I know anecdotally, we hear um, through our, our partners um, how it's been working. So that's been great, but we do want to figure out how can we capture that data to make sure that um, it's replicated either in other offices or we borrow best practices from other hate crime task force um, that are happening 
through through this grant. So we're really excited about it. We're excited to get you more involved in that. So definitely look out for an email from me. And then if you have any questions or ideas of some of the things that I just talked about, please just uh, pick up the phone, send me an email. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more um, about the work that we envision uh, the future to be of our task force. So thank you, DA Ryan. Thanks, Antonio. And I want to thank Antonia too. She's done a lot of the legwork and the putting things together. And if you have any of you who've gotten grants know it is a tedious process. Mm -hmm. So I have to say she has done the yeoman's work on all of that. So I'm grateful. But but again, we owe that to you. Um, you have been with us over these four years and you know, come and helped us and moved us forward. So that is a great thing. And I'm really I'm proud that we're able to help other people by what we've learned here. So let's turn to our topic today. We're going to talk today about ageism. And unfortunately, it's one of the most socially acceptable forms of prejudice. Um, it often goes unrecognized or unchallenged. And compared to other kinds of discrimination, which may get called out in a much more um, vocal way. And I think it's interesting always to me how um, Hollywood sometimes follows what we are seeing. If any of you have seen, there's a new show on TV called Matlock. And many of you might remember the old Matlock. He was a lawyer and was always a winning lawyer and all of that. Well, this story is about a woman who is a lawyer. And the premise is that she is an extraordinarily wealthy woman. She lost her daughter to the opioid epidemic. And she believes that that was in part because of the actions of some companies, um, man opioid manufacturers and their law firms. So she is a lawyer herself and she has decided to kind of go underground in some of those firms and gather the evidence about how they were not telling the truth to patients about what opioids meant. So that's all one piece. And it sounds like that would be part of our opioid task force. But what she continues to offer as the way that she is so effective in the story is she says that when you are a woman of a certain age, people just pay no attention to you. And they assume that you don't know anything and that you're sort of bumbling about. And as a result, they allow you access to all kinds of things because they don't suspect you of anything. So she uses that really not funny but view that many people have to, and the series is about a month, a month and a half old now. And in each episode, she kind of illustrates how people think, well, she can't possibly understand about computers. So they don't lock their computers. They're not paying attention. And meanwhile, she's getting all kinds of information. Or she sent in to interview someone and the people assume that they were more clever than she is and she's not going to be able to understand. And so they, she manages to extract all kinds of really valuable information. So it's just interesting to me that for something that is so pervasive, so often not called out, and now we have a TV show that's looking at, which I consider a good thing. I think it's always a good thing when people are talking about it. And it's that actress, Kathy Bates, who mm -hmm. makes a big part of the story that that's what she's responding to is that feeling. So we in this office have always been committed to really making um, abuse of elders a priority. Before I became the DA, I spent about 15 years as the chief of our elder and disabled unit. Um, I prosecuted lots of crimes involving physical, financial abuse of very vulnerable victims. You know, it's interesting in many parts of the country, our population is aging and people are staying in communities. But in Middlesex County, as high as those numbers are everywhere else, the number of folks in our county over the age of 60 is 10% higher than the rest of the state. Um, that in part reflects the kinds of communities we have, many of which are really accessible for people and also the resources in terms of facilities here. But we have a very large population over the age of 60 here. And we also have a very large population of folks over the age of 60 with a lot of resources. So they become targets of so many things. Um, we've been very intentional about the steps that we've taken to support elders, to raise awareness around those steps and in making sure that families 
and friends and communities have information to be able to help to protect folks. We launched um, the Middlesex Senior Health and Safety Initiative in 2014, which was a comprehensive training program for first responders. You know, we really discovered who goes into people's houses, especially seniors who are isolated. It's the fire department when it's a fall. It's the police department when, you know, the water heater goes, it's things like that. We wanted them going in there, not just focused on the problem, but taking a bigger look at what they were seeing in that house and being aware of what resources they could offer to folks. So they didn't walk out you know, of a terrible hoarding situation or a situation where people had nothing in the refrigerator because they were just there to help somebody off the ground and that they, they were making the, taking those steps. We've held senior protection seminars across the county to alert seniors to scams. You'll, If you look at our website, you'll see we're always posting, especially after um, a natural disaster, for instance, after the hurricanes, you know, we were posting a lot because the scammers take advantage of that. People want to be generous. They want to be helpful. Um, they're collecting money. It's not going to the hurricane victims. So we've been doing a lot of that. Um, and also really working with banks and other institutions to think about how can we better safeguard people. Um, we continue to collaborate with our police departments. I'm happy to see Lieutenant Jones here today from Bedford, who's been a great collaborator for really decades about that. Um, and going out, and we are happy to come in your community to the Senior Center, the Council on Aging, any of those places, and really talk about what you can, what the new scams are. And there is literally a new scam every 15 minutes. Um, and also to talk about the thing that people don't want to talk about, which is that the vast amounts of money that people lose, lose, seniors lose, most of it is lost to family and friends. And that's what people don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all think it's sort of the sweepstakes scam. And it is, but it's also the son or daughter who's cleaning out the six-figure bank account. And then we find that out when mom or dad needs a different level of care. So we filed some bills to do that. Um, for instance, this session... We filed a bill with Representative Kate Lipper-Garabedian, which is entitled an act to protect the property of the elderly and disabled. Um, and this, this would create a new offense for anyone who tries to take the property of an elder or disabled person without actual consent. Um, and it would require that whenever some an elder or disabled person is conveying some property to somebody, that there be a neutral party there, making sure that they really mean to be doing that. Um, and it arose out of a terrible case of ours where a woman who had refused for decades to sell her property to her neighbor, um, partly because she didn't want to sell her property and partly because she didn't like her neighbor, um, when she was in a nursing home, literally IVs in the arm on morphine, he came in ostensibly as a visitor and had her sign a deed transferring the property to him. Um, obviously, we don't want that happening. And those cases are very hard to prosecute. We did successfully prosecute him. He appealed and the Supreme Judicial Court said that we were arguing anyone seeing her in the condition she was in in the hospital, barely conscious on a number of IVs, um, clearly not able to be making good decisions, would have known that they were tricking and taking that property in a way they should not. And the court said that was not enough that we had to be able to show that anybody would have been able to tell, you know, and the idea that she could have been old and sick and just wanted to get rid of her property. Um, a ruling I could speak a lot about, but I won't, but it did compel us to have to file a new piece of legislation. That legislation didn't, as is often the case, it didn't pass this session the first time we did it, but we'll be refiling. Um, we'll be coming back to all of you, asking you to, raise that with your legislators. Um, and keeping in mind, I find I always find this amazing, legislators will tell you that the number of people they need to hear from, you know, they have hundreds of pieces of legislation. They can't give full attention to all of them, but the magic number to put a piece of legislation on their radar is six. Uh -huh. So they hear from six constituents about a piece of legislation that causes them to direct their staff to go find that piece of legislation and work on it. Um, and so what that really shows is that 
there does need to be that multifaceted approach, educational, intergovernmental, intergenerational programs, policy changes, and just an increase in awareness about that. All of our presenters today have made significant contributions to raising awareness about elder abuse and ageism, advocating for systemic change and providing insight into the complex issues around treating seniors in our society. So we're gonna begin with our first speaker, Margaret Goulet, who is a leading cultural critic and author who's made so many contributions in this field. She's written several award-winning books, including Ending Ageism or How Not to Shoot Old People. As a prosecutor, I support that title. Um, and Age-Wise, Fighting the New Ageism in America. She is a resident scholar at Brandeis University's Women's Studies Research Center. And she's really been at the forefront of exposing and combating ageism in different forums, forums from cultural stereotypes to institutional discrimination. So Margaret, we're delighted to have you with us this morning. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Welcome to everybody who has come to hear about this. Um, it's a, a new departure, at least for the task force, I understand. Although um, uh, D.A. Ryan's background in uh, fighting age-related crimes is certainly very impressive. I have a new book out, and I um, it's called American Elder Side, and it talks about uh, many things, but the connection between um, the deaths in the nursing homes across the United States and ageism in a very complex form, which I will describe. Um, that I call compound ageism, um, is what I will be presenting about today. Now, I was going to ask how many of you on the call are over 65, but because so many of you are, have blank screens, I can't see your hands. But I would be interested to know how many, if any, are over 65. And I also would have asked whether you know someone who is in a nursing home now or in the past, or whether you yourselves have had some experience in nursing homes, because I think um, it makes a tremendous difference uh, what age you are and also whether you've had this experience. Now, I'm going to be talking mostly about Massachusetts, not the whole United States. And I'm going to start by just mentioning another uh, couple of facts about Middlesex. Um, our state, Massachusetts, now has 32,800 vulnerable, older, and disabled individuals who are housed in about 345 different facilities under the auspices of Mass Health or Medicaid and, of course, the federal government. Now, the important fact for us today is that Middlesex County has 10,000 of those residents. That is almost a full third. So the state responsibility is shared among everybody in the state. It's certainly shared with the state government. Um, and it is a tremendous responsibility. And we know that because I argue in my book, American Elder Side, that the U.S. deaths from COVID in 2020 and 2021 had many causes, but ageism was fun fundamental to all the other causes. And ageism was compounded by sexism, ableism, dementism, which is the fear of Alzheimer's and other cognitive impairments, racism, and most of all, I would say, classism. There was an elder side in Massachusetts, and I can tell you right now how fundamental compound ageism was to the elder side here. Massachusetts, our progressive state. I have to tell you, this is a painful story. In places, it's almost incredible. I believe that a lot of evil was done. You are a better place than I to judge what malfeasance or what kinds of malfeasance could be considered criminal. But I may be mentioning one or two incidents, one or two kinds of abuse that I believe are criminal. To start with facts, the facts of mortality. At one point early in the COVID era, Massachusetts had the highest rate of death in nursing homes per capita in the country. WBUR reported in October 2020 
that the death rate from the virus in nursing homes was 90 times that of the entire statewide death rate. In the first year, also, a staggering one in five of all the people living in senior care sites before the pandemic died of COVID. This happened under former, former Governor Charlie Baker. Early on, Baker was warned by experts that residents of nursing homes were vulnerable. 40% were over 85, um, a use of chronology that implies other things. In mid-March 2020, researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology warned Baker and his health secretary, Mary Lou Sutters, during an evening meeting at the home of the MIT president that his nursing homes were dangerously exposed to COVID. Here's a quote from the Boston Globe. We said, here are the facilities. You need to protect them, said Retta Levy, a management professor. But the residents were not protected. Early on, this is a quote, there was a lack of prioritization for nursing homes. Hospitals were seen as the epicenter of the crisis. But the fact is, the nursing homes were the epicenter of the crisis. The author of a Brandeis University thesis describing the choices made by many governors agreed that Massachusetts was at fault for also preferring community dwellers to nursing facility residents. As in many other states, this is a quote from the thesis, the Brandeis thesis, the Baker administration prioritized hospitals and early response measures by helping them to secure resources, even though they were in a better position to bid for PPE, personal protective equipment, than nursing home facilities. And their other failure was including hospital leadership in planning meetings, during which the voice of nursing home leadership was not invited. Not Margaret, I'm so sorry that can you um people are there's so much good information, people are finding it a little hard to hear you. Um I can make I just made it a little louder, but Okay, good. Uh, good, thanks. Sorry, so sorry to have interrupted you. No, no, I want people to hear. You're right. There um uh, there is a lot of information at the beginning, less going on. Um, but this is timely. Massachusetts nursing homes were 88% white at that time. So the predominantly white establishment ignored white privilege when whiteness was linked to old age, old women, and frailty. These are all the stereotypes about residents. But racism also differentiated people's faith. Nursing homes that served more people of color, who were on average younger than white, six years younger, had on average 25% more COVID deaths than predominantly white facilities. I have references for all of this, but um, you can ask me, anybody who wants can ask me about the references. Well, after references, after residents had died in such appalling numbers, Baker lowered the numbers so the catastrophe would not look so embarrassing for his administration. Other states did that too. Uh, on April 14th, 2021, Massachusetts had one of the highest reported nursing home COVID death rates in the country with over 9,000 dead. The next day, uh, the Globe reported, it plummeted 39% to 5,500, according to the official state count. Now, all over the state, mourners knew that their loved ones in nursing homes suffered grievous deaths from COVID, which were deaths of air hunger, alone, and often without funerals. If the mourners think their parents and their grandparents and their relatives and friends died prematurely and unnecessarily, they are right. Dr. David Grabowski of Harvard Medical School, a learned researcher, was taken aback by what's called excess mortality. Quote, I don't think even those of us who work in this area thought it was going to be this bad. This was not individuals who were going to die anyway. And I'm going to repeat that sentence because this is one of the big takeaways of my book. This was not individuals who were going to die anyway. We are talking about a really big number of excess deaths. Wherever residents of nursing homes were protected, however, no one died. No one died. Mary's Meadows in Holyoke was just a few miles from the Holyoke Veterans Home where Baker had ordered two units of cognitively impaired 
people to be merged. No one died at Mary's Meadows, which was run by Sister Joan Mullen and Sister Mary Caritas Geary. Well, there, and in 1,950 true homes across the nation, out of, I'll tell you how many facilities there were in the country, 15,477, in those 1,950 true homes, everyone survived until vaccine. To wake up in the morning, to say howdy to a neighbor, to see their families on FaceTime, and to wait until the vaccine came. In other facilities, they were abandoned. They had been segregated in those homes, and then they were locked down, and they were left without adequate PPE or adequate attention. And adequate attention, I'm going to come back to that, because that's understaffing. But unlike what went on in the Holyoke Soldiers' Home, where the AG, the then AG, charged two administrators, the press and the public didn't understand that the deaths in the nursing facilities were also excess, shocking, and unnecessary. And the AG charged no one. Massachusetts' astonishing elder side in 2020 belied the state's reputation for progressivism. It belied our admired medical and surgical care and the relative wealth of our citizens. Unfortunately, what went wrong in 2019 and 2020 is still happening. Now, so I'm coming back to understaffing. Understaffing is still rampant. And understaffing maims and kills. It's also terrible on the morale of the people who suffer from it. Understaffing leads, just for example, to neglected turning. And poor skin care leads to pressure ulcers, grinding pain, sepsis, and even death. Delays in responding to calls, that is, within the institution, lead to falls and broken bones as people with limited mobility try to help themselves to get to their walkers or to get to the bathroom themselves. Understaffing also leads to the spread of infections, a main source of misery, pain, and death long before COVID and since. Understaffing is correlated with more use of antipsychotics or even illegal restraint. The practice is widespread, but Black or Latinx residents are likelier to suffer. Massachusetts actually rates badly for inflicting antipsychotics on inmates. Oversedation is another common result of inadequate staffing. But its hundreds of facilities receive zero harm citations for drug overuse. I'll say that again. Hundreds of facilities receive zero harm citations for drug overuse. Massachusetts, during the early part of COVID, many waivers were sent out by the Center for Medicare, Medicaid, waivers of care. Massachusetts was one of 17 states that asked to be kept on the lower standard of training hours when the weaker COVID rules were overturned elsewhere. What adherence to a care plan, each resident gets a care plan, can there be if your state prefers Picayune training requirements for CNAs? These are the main people to help. They want to help, they're good people, and if they are understaffed, they cannot help the way they would like. On the book, on the book, now, this is important. Massachusetts has the highest minimum staffing hours in the nation. 3.58 hours per person per day. Now, the experts tell me that it should be 4.1 hours minimum. So, 3.58 hours per person, that's a decent rule. The care plan a person gets depends on what they need. Some paralyzed people need to be turned in the bed often to avoid bed sores. And some residents need two people using a hoist to get up to walk or to go to the toilet. And some need a nurse and not a CNA. So these hours matter. 3.58 per person is higher than what President Biden set last fall in a historic improvement. I have to give him credit. He is the first president since Medicaid began to actually set a minimum standard. And he set 3.48 hours. So Massachusetts gives residents six minutes more a day. Now, those extra minutes count. 
Studies consistently show that the higher the staffing standard, the better the outcomes for residents. Higher staffing rules save lives. And researchers estimate that the federal sta staffing standard, if it is implemented, and I underscore this, if it is implemented, would save nearly 13,000 lives a year. There is a difference, however, between aims and legislation and implementation. It is not words on paper that count, but deeds performed in the tiny ring. That's what counts. Guess what percentage of Massachusetts nursing homes reach the standard that their owners and operators are told by the state that they are responsible for? Well, I won't keep you waiting. Unfortunately, as of the latest information, nearly three quarters or about 260 of our Massachusetts facilities fall below the state standard. The executive branch seems unable to compel the mandate. 72 facilities, that's 20%, even fell below President Biden's original standard, which was three hours. In 2021, across the United States, 6% of the nursing homes achieved 4.1 hours per person which is the minimum necessary given the current levels of acuity, which means how many people really need this kind of care. So we know from those 6% of nursing homes that sufficiency can be met. Massachusetts is also, this is more bad news about Massachusetts, I'm sorry to say, Massachusetts is chronically listed in the bottom 10% of states in holding, it's late in holding inspections and late in resolving complaints. The Department of Public Health has 3,000 employees across a patchwork of agencies that are responsible for nursing facilities. For example, licenses, funding, ombudsman, but it doesn't have enough inspectors. And the inspectors are what makes things happen. 82 nursing home inspectors were soldering, soldering the highest caseload of any state in the industry. American Elderside argues that the 1.4 million residents of nursing homes were abandoned, and not only in Massachusetts, but all over the United States. There were murderous touches in that abandonment that the most cynical fiction writer or public health advocate could not have imagined. This has to do with medical agency. This next astonishing situation. There was an antiviral medication, Paxlovid, that was discovered to help people recover from COVID. It saved lives. When I got COVID much later, my doctor prescribed it for me. Residents were, quote, exactly the intended demographic for these types of medications, said Brian McGarry, a professor of geriatrics and aging at the University of Rochester. But there was, and I quote again, this is from Michael Barnett of Harvard, a massive underuse of tax loaded, particularly in nursing homes, that, quote, almost certainly led to a lot of avoidable mortality. They're not giving tax loaded to residents of nursing homes. Now, where does this come from? Your tax force, a powerful initiative, was created after the murder of George George, and that galvanized me, too, the long wary of the police. I marched with an integrated Newton church group I put the sign out on my porch, and with neighbors, I walked the main street holding Black Lives Matter and similar signs for weeks. But no one marched for the lost thousands of residents in nursing homes. No one wore a shirt saying Old Lives Matter to recognize the social injustice. I'm going to stand up here. I hope you can see this. It says Old Lives Matter. I saw that years ago at a social work convention in Ohio, and a black woman was wearing it. Okay, so no one at the time, no one since, has worn a shirt saying Old Lives Matter to recognize social injustice. And no one has raised a monument to the dead in the nursing home. Of course, many people cared. Some became obsessed with reforming, um, and many became activists. Dignity Alliance Massachusetts was formed by people who had been in public health for decades, and they were. It's a huge coalition. 
So there's my button. I hope everybody can see my button. So they can do a line presentation. Anybody here can join. Paul and Zikos is going to tell us more about it. He's one of the co-founders and leaders. And legislators led by Pat Jalen and Tom Stanley restarted the effort. Pat Jalen had been in nursing home reform for 16 years, he told me. Pat Jalen and Tom Stanley restarted the efforts that became the long-term care bill, chapter 197 of the Act of 2024. And at the same time, as all of this was happening, I started writing American Herbicide. So, as Mary Ryan said, we use tragedy and we use crime and we try to make things better. Now, you all, and Mary and Ryan and Antonia, and Antonia Thompson's team, are bravely expanding your horizons of understanding and compassion. I've described quickly, quickly, some deadly effects of compound ageism. Now, as I understand my role, you may want to know some of the causes. And again, ageism is acceptable and it's not even understood what it means. Racism has a known backstory, 400 years of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, police violence. Ageism has few such ready connotations. People may entertain ageist prejudices or ableist prejudices or prejudices against people with cognitive impairments unreflectively. Implicit ageism is the kind that people deny they have, yet 95% of the participants in a survey revealed they held negative views of older adults. This is a higher proportion than for implicit racism or implicit sexism. I have called ageism a hate crime, and I think that's what said Antonio to my book. And it certainly can be a hate crime. Old men shoot their wives who are sick and sometimes dying. And in my earlier book, I described this and I quoted the data. And this was happening in Florida pretty regularly. And often the men were not charged. So I knew about lethal ageism before COVID happened. Now let me raise this issue. It's a philosophical issue and also a legal issue. And I guess it's a linguistic issue. Was the abandonment of residents to COVID a hate crime? Compound ageism in the behavior of people with power over thousands of others that they do not know personally doesn't require that they actually hate feeble old people they were responsible for. And I include here President Trump, Governor Baker, the director of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. The director at that time was a woman named Seema Verma. They don't have to hate them. But evil can come from alienation, from indifference, from the desire to shun the unlucky, the indigent, the sick, old ladies with mental health problems, cognitive problems, behavioral health problems, and people with multi-morbidity. They have been so thoroughly dehumanized that those feelings don't have to be called hate, but the effects can be the same. Summarizing the lack of government precautions taken for residents, writers, and a journal for medical directors of nursing homes felt that compound ageism results in what they call societal revulsion. Societal revulsion. Our cultural fear and societal revulsion around aging have simply rendered invisibly, invisible, invisible, simply have rendered invisible the patient and resident population and also the workforce of post-acute and long-term care. So we have to think about this aspect of it, which is more invisible to us, like the people. When compound ageism is widespread, as it is in the United States, it is a powerful suppressor of public concern because it means the media carries less information and there are fewer outraged editorials about what goes wrong in nursing homes. And such omissions keep citizens like you and me inert. We had lived for a long time in the age of the new longevity, and we were proud of our rising life expectancy. But that pride vanished in 2020. And there, here is where I come to what I think of as one of the major causes. Weren't older, sicker people going to die anyway? Most media and government agencies presented graphs 
that were focused on mortality by age, not on ageism, racism, or xenophobia, or classism, or ableism, or sexism, or residents in nursing facilities as the most important cultural and socioeconomic determinants of physical disability and death in the nursing home. So they focused on age alone, not on any of these other factors. And this narrow focus confirmed the biomedical construction of older adults as bodies that will fail. Belief in the futility of care bonded. Belief in the futility of care. The belief in the futility of care is, I believe, it swept across the country. It bonded onto pre-existing prejudice from the before time, the perceived lesser value of older, less productive, or more disabled lives. And the refrain was burden. And this was the public refrain. These people were a burden to the rest of us. The U.S. has a long history of belief in eugenics that the weak should not live. COVID mortality, data, and scarcity of supplies brought many Americans, including doctors, to the idea that saving older lives was evil. Um, the nursing home lobby had long sought immunity for substandard care. With COVID, quote, the industry seized on this public health crisis to pursue immunity. The American Bar Association commented. As early as May 2020, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which oversees Medicare and Medicaid, told the governors that shielding the owners of nursing homes was imperative. Now, there were objections. 250 national, state, and local advocacy organizations objected. To no avail, 38 states decided to protect the owners by eliminating the residents' right to sue. You couldn't make this up. Nina Cohen, a Yale law professor, concluded that operators could be increasingly confident that they would never be able, never be held accountable for decisions that harm the residents. And Massachusetts was one of those 38 states. Some failures may correlate with donations from nursing home executives. Their lobby spends millions on Congress. It's still doing it. In the year before May 2020, the year before COVID hit, Governor Baker received $52,000 and House Speaker Robert DeLeo $47,000 from that lobby, according to the Office of Campaign and Political Finance. In 2023, howls from the lobby prevented the 3.58-hour state standard from rising to 4.1, according to Richard Moore, who is a former state senator and one of the co-founders of Dignity Alliance, Massachusetts. The power of industry lobbies over legislation and regulation was called corporate state capture. Corporate state capture may partly explain why, despite all the good hearts in the legislature, beating strongly for long-term care, Chapter 197 took four years to pass. What about conscience? in the midst of alienation and corruption. James Baldwin had a theory that blindness to injustice was caused by mournful fullness of pride. He was explaining the emotions that made white Americans so dangerous to black Americans in the Jim Crow era. Baldwin had an intuition of how racists felt after they acted in ways that he could see as wickedness. White supremacists couldn't see the evil in their violence. Pride encourages the morbid illusion that there is no other side. There are no victims, no one who matters. who are going to die anyway. This kind of pride justifies blindness. Baldwin's insight can be applied to other forms of discrimination, including our vast unsavory archive of ageism, ableism, dementism, sexism, and racism. Public figures align with what they consider the good side. The legislature that gave owners immunity from legal suits may have had front of mind that whatever their known rapacity and self-dealing, the owners kept nursing homes operating. And we couldn't do without nursing homes. Or could we? Well, we could and we will. With the Marsters decision, we may get more people out of nursing 
Under Chapter 197, the long-term care bill that Maura Healy signed in September 2024, Massachusetts, uh, until that point, Massachusetts state government has had a long, painful record of underserving residents of nursing facilities. Compound ageism was what underpinned corruption, legislative lethargy, executive unwillingness or inability to enforce reg regulations, and the Department of Public Health that has been lax and uncoordinated. Will this change now? We have to wait to see. The executive branch gets 90 days to read the act and figure out to comply. And my question to all of you is, will each of you change what is in your power to change? It is possible to overcome ignorance of fact, the ugly idea that elder care is futile that older and disabled residents are just waiting to die in their eight by 12 spaces. Enlightenment can be emotionally beneficial to us. It leads to warmth rather than alienation. It leads to heart changes. Yet something is required that is even more salient than knowledge. Philosopher Judith Butler says, we have to take it on faith, an internal desire to subdue one's own sense of priority and prideful superiority. If a desire for equity is not innate, how could it exist at all? How would we have a sense of injustice to be awakened? So thank you. Thank you for your time and your interest in this subject. Thank you so much, uh, Margaret. That, that was, um, Thank you for sharing that. And I will, at the end of this, what you were asking of us, you know, I have to admit my own like bias and just not understanding the depth of this problem. So I thank you so much for that. And as you said, you had your editor letter in 21 to the Globe categorizing ageism as a hate crime. And that just really made me think of it from that perspective that it probably should be. And I guess my question to you is, do you see where there is types of regulations around the nursing home and so forth it sounds like that's not enough. What would you think? Would you think that it would need to be codified in a criminal statute to make sure that, um, you know, our elders are heard in that and through that hate crime lens? Um, that's a tough question. And maybe I'm not the expert to ask about it. Um, but I, I am, I was very moved by a movie called Stolen Time. Um, in which there is uh, she's a personal injury lawyer. Her name is Melissa Miller. And she goes after owners who um, whose non-season has gone to the point of causing death. And she can only get civil penalties, millions. And she is at the beginning of a huge attempt to make um, what are called mass torts. Again, you people know more about mass courts than I do. I think um, we we call them, um, uh, we have a different name for them in the United States. But the attempt is to understand that understaffing uh, that can even lead to death is, is a common problem in Massachusetts and in the United States. So, I mean, I hope um, that, that the people who do think about crime um, and crimes that are the result of this new category, compound ageism, I hope you'll be able to figure out how to deal with this issue. Um, because I don't think it should just be a, the personal injury lawyers who get into this. I mean, they get, a, they get a payday, but they also get the satisfaction of bringing some closure to the family members who have seen uh, or not seen because the nursing homes are very um, quiet about what goes wrong. And often the the parent, the patients, and it's not just during COVID when there was a lockdown and you couldn't get in to see your people. I mean, you can be told that everything is okay when in fact um, there is a hole the size of a fist in your mother's backside that has come from under, well, has come from not being turned it comes from having a wound ignored. It comes from having the wound go deeper and leading to sepsis. And the woman actually was taken to the hospital only in time to die. So this is one of the cases in which um, the 
this girl, Melissa Miller, did get closure for the for the family. And I, I, I think they were pained but grateful. That, that's all I can say. I mean, if you can figure this out, people will be pained but grateful. And thank you for the question. Margaret, thank you for that great information. Thank you. All right, turning now to our next presenter, um, Jerry Halberstadt. He, Jerry is a multifaceted professional. He's got a rich background in writing, editing, publishing, photography, and advocacy. Um, born and educated in Cambridge, he graduated from Harvard College in 1960 with a degree in history and literature. He then pursued graduate studies in anthropology at Columbia, earning his master's degree in 1965 Throughout his career, Jerry has been deeply committed to both public service and to advocacy. Um, about 12 years ago now, in 2012, he co-founded the Stop Bullying Coalition. And his dedication to that cause led to his appointment by Governor Baker to the commission to study the ways to prevent bullying of tenants in public and subsidized multifamily housing. And he served there from 2016 to 17. He currently lives in subsidized housing in Peabody. He's been there since 2018. And he brings a really personal perspective to the advocacy work. Jerry's diverse skill set and his experience mm. have shaped him as a passionate advocate for social justice, particularly in the realm of housing and community relations. So Jerry, it's always a pleasure to see you. It's lovely to have you with us this morning. DA Ryan, thank you uh, so much for that introduction and for, um, and I want to thank you and ADA Thompson for inviting me uh, and, and giving me the honor of uh, uh, speaking. Uh, so, uh, and I want to say hello to, uh, I was going to say ladies and gentlemen and my friends, but I just think I'll say friends and colleagues because uh, I, I, I don't want to distinguish uh, uh, among people. Uh, D.A. Ryan, I have long admired your proactive efforts in educating and mobilizing community leaders preventing harm to elderly people. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for that work and, and to all your, all your people who collaborate in that um, important uh, uh, effort. Thank you. The, this task force uh, led by ADA Thompson is a bulwark against the flood of hate, bias, and disrespect that threatens to overwhelm us. So much depends on maintaining community support for decency and respect. <clears throat> Margaret, I just want to comment that uh, in 2020, I got COVID and since then have been very aware uh, how in public and subsidized housing, not just in nursing homes, uh, 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 there's, there's absolutely, well, I, I could be the only person in my building wearing an N95 mask. You know, people living in a lot, in, in an unreal world, COVID is still with us, it's still killing people. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but on to, on to the more uh, general issues. While the Office of the District Attorney deals with crime, our work in the Stop Bullying Coalition deals with harms that are as bad as physical assault, that there is no remedy and no protection. Uh, let me pose two mysteries and... and you're welcome to uh, uh, propose a solution or wait till the end. Uh, and I'll tell you how it worked out. <clears throat> Rising Creek, and that's, that's a pseudonym, was managed by the Bethlehem Housing Authority under the old State Department of Housing and Community Development. Four members of the Housing Authority were elected by residents of Bethlehem and one was appointed by the governor. When a group of tenants attempted to start a tenants association, a series of poorly qualified manage, managers used bullying and collaborated with a group of favored tenants 
to attack and suppress the activists. Uh, and when you have a group like that, that's mobbing. Uh, currently, uh, very recently, at the Salem Housing Authority, um, Veronica Miranda uh, is a tenant and commissioner, is chair of the board, and she enabled tenants to raise criticisms of management during public meetings. As the public meeting law uh, mandates, you have to allow, if you're going to have a public meeting, people can say what they want, even if you don't like it, even if it's rude. And she has pursued oversight of management, which is her job. Several senior staff people raised serious accusations of Miranda in what seemed like an apparent effort to stifle criticism. Don't rock the boat, was, was their message. The observed, forgive me, this is, this is a little dense, so I'll, I'll, if you have questions, feel free. The observed diff difference between a multifamily housing situation that is beset by conflict, bullying, mobbing, and harassment, and a situation where the residents are respected, have their dignity and peaceful enjoyment, and even experience joy may be explained by three factors, values, managerial competence, accountability, and oversight. Values, competence, accountability. <clears throat> and like nursing homes, there isn't any. Multifamily, public, and subsidized housing are complex systems without accountability and oversight. In public housing, the housing provider is, is the local housing authority represented by five commissioners, including one tenant. They hire and supervise the executive director who manages the operation. Mobbing and hostile environment harassment are much more harmful than bullying. And I'll give you definition uh, in, in a couple of minutes. As we search for the key to bring peace and safety to housing, we need to open a combination lock because no one change can fix the system. The combination we need will include legislation for training and resources and accountability for the housing provider. The tenant perspective. We tenants are poor, we are elderly, we are disabled, yet we are deserving of, and we now demand respect. Um, Antonio, can, can you run through the slide, please? Thank you. Do you see it up? Oh. Yeah, I see it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I just, I want the pictures to speak for themselves. But basically what I'm trying to say with the pictures is, these are nice people. These are decent people. And I didn't want to show the misery and the stress I wanted you to appreciate that these are, these are people deserving of respect. And hanging over us all the time is the threat of eviction and that's the um, Uh, 
If we just go to that very last picture, please. This was in a this was in a in an event um, at Apple Village in Beverly. Uh, subsidized housing. Two groups of uh, elderly tenants at daggers drawn. Mm -hmm. And it's a long story as to how that happened and why. And but on the left you see a woman who's trying to pacify and a very angry woman on the right. And the woman on the right is part of a group that when an eviction case went to court, they won. So that's, okay, thank you. Oh, and this is, uh, we'll get to Veronica Miranda, who wasn't able to stay for the whole meeting, uh, but she's the young woman who's the uh, 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 chair of the Housing Authority in Salem. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so let me move on. So, you know, Ageism is part of it, but broadly speaking, I think, you know, this country says, if you're poor, you're elderly, you're disabled, you don't count. And I think it's the same thing for people of, uh, of color. <clears throat> so if some housing authorities are rife with bullying, mobbing, and harassment, and others are not. Let's see if we can understand the differences. Prejudices are at the root of much pain and suffering in public and subsidized housing for the elderly, disabled, and others. In public and subsidized housing for the elderly and disabled, bullying, mobbing, and harassment are inappropriate methods of social control. They can be motivated by racial or other forms of bias and hate. Similar behavior is part of mobbing and motivated by efforts to force conformity and subservience on a tenant. The targets may or may not be attacked because of the race or other legally protected identity. The fact is, any characteristic can be used to justify why someone doesn't belong here. Um, um, you know, how they dress, uh, uh, what they do with their time or not, any, anything. That person doesn't belong here. Bullying consists of any mode of communication to hurt and demean the target or victim. Mobbing consists of a group or community harassing and bullying a victim through cooperative or aggressive behavior, including in order to get them to leave their residence. Mobbing depends on the persistence of a closed administrative, social, and political system that prevents the victim from invoking their right and legal remedies. Um, the term mobbing comes from a study of, of animals and birds. Um, a, a flock of crows, and I guess they call it a murder of crows. <laughs> um, I've seen I've seen how they will harass a uh, red-tailed hawk probably to protect their, you know, their nests and so on. So let me move, move on. So an example, the new tenant is certifiably crazy. She doesn't belong here. Let's do a petition to get rid of her. And here's what some experts say. Humans will almost always turn against each other 
when leadership signals that someone is a undesirable and or, or, and or weak, vulnerable, or a threat. Mobbing affects our sense of belonging, our self-esteem, our sense of self-worth, our sense of control over our lives, and our sense of having a meaningful existence. Mobbing is a much more sophisticated way of doing someone in than murder. Regardless of the underlying motivation, prejudice or the low social status of tenants or competition for power and control, the person who is a target of mobbing experiences constant pain, stress, uh, isolation, depression, gets bad. Hostile environment harassment, and that comes from, from a, a fair housing rule this, uh, as a source. Hostile environment harassment is unwelcome conduct, creating a situation that makes it difficult or impossible for victims to have the peaceful enjoyment of their residency. So what are the differences between a safe, welcoming community and a, 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 a terrible community? Values, competence, oversight. The values, culture, and politics of the host municipality. Uh, the commissioners are appointed or elected locally. The quality of management. The good manager supported by the housing provider, the board, can overcome and prevent bullying and mobbing. Is the board a take charge conscientious group when they don't hire and supervise the good manager? There's no effective intervention and nobody holds the commissioners to account. Are the commissioners responsive to local civic leadership? And is that leadership supportive of tenant rights and respect? And sometimes the well-run tenant organization can have some influence. Now, the answer to the, the mystery, will it rise and creep? Following a change in the composition of the housing board, a new manager was appointed. Practically overnight, the bullying, harassing, and mobbing ended. Now, why did this happen? I think because of two values that compete. One value is that people in public housing are not deserving of respect. The other competing value is that society has an obligation to care for the weak, including the elderly and the disabled, and that they are entitled to respect as well as housing. The local community in which housing is embedded can exhibit a variety of responses based on different values, values that can coexist within each person or social group. These two beliefs about tenants and other marginalized people have deep roots in our culture and play out in national and local political life. The balance between them changes in part due to the actions of individuals joining together in advocacy, in large part due to local, state, and national politics. In Bethlehem, advocacy finally got beyond that closed system of housing and reach the wider community to invoke the values of dignity, respect, and mutual responsibility that are deeply rooted in New England and in Bethlehem. The positive changes at Rising Creek, including the choice of a new manager, came from the same town that had condoned the mobbing. In Salem, where the other commissioners had been willing to accept the dominance of the executive director, uh, Veronica Miranda sought to introduce accountability and allow a voice for tenants. The strong support of the public was critical to a resolution. Now, Chair Miranda, the commissioners, and the executive director, along with all the other actors, have a new chance to establish an appropriate power balance. The solutions are hard to come by. 
legislation and funding can provide guidance, best practices and resources to enable housing providers to do a better job. In addition, we need oversight and accountability to protect tenants from bad management when the housing authority commissioners fail to prevent hostile environment harassment. Therefore, we support the creation of the Office of the Tenant Advocate in the Office of the Attorney General. And although she's not here, I want to give a shout out to uh, Senator Joan Lovely, who from the start has been our uh, partner and uh, advocate on Beacon Hill uh, for bills that, that, that could introduce these changes. All of us together must work together to use education and advocacy to support mutual respect. The problems in housing are a reflection of community values. You can be so proud of the work done by the anti-hate, anti-bias task force. I hope you will have ideas about how to improve life in public and subsidized housing and how we find the keys to overcoming conflict and prejudice in our villages, towns, and cities. And I'll put my contact information uh, in the chat and, and welcome hearing from anybody with ideas, criticism. Um, finally, thank you all for what you do. Thank you, Jerry. That was very helpful. Thank you. Good picture of that. Um, and we'll follow up with the recording and all of the con uh, contact information. And finally, turning to our next speaker, um, Paul Lanzillos is the co-founder of the Dignity Alliance of Massachusetts. He's the co-leader of its coordinating committee and the co-chair of its long-term care nursing facilities work group. Um, Paul brings 50 years of experience in designing, implementing, managing, and analyzing programs that serve older adults. He's had the privilege of testifying before congressional panels, federal and executive agencies, and state legislative bodies regarding elder care policy and program development at both the state and the national level. In the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the spring of 2020, at the outset of the pandemic, Paul co-founded Dignity Alliance Massachusetts to transform the provision of long-term services, support, and care in the Commonwealth through a changes in the pub public policy, legislative regulations, and best practices. He serves as the coordinator and primary spokesperson for the Alliance. He's held several faculty appointments in the graduate healthcare management program. He received his bachelor's degree from Boston College and his MBA with the certificate in healthcare management from BU. In May of 2015, he was awarded a doctorate in humane lettuce and you may letter his honorary degree from Salem State University. So Paul, wonderful to have you with us this morning. Well, thank you very much, uh, DA Ryan. And uh, let me mention very briefly um, before I begin my presentation, um, your comment about the, um, the, um, the real estate transaction and the, the legislation you're proposing is I, I can uh, relate to that when I was executive director of North Shore Elder Services, uh, we experienced a, a situation very similar to that. And um, unfortunately our hands also were tied um, and uh, there, was no, there was nothing virtually we could do about stopping the transaction. Uh, so I would say um, uh, when you have the text um, or if you have the text now for and when we find that bill, uh, please send it to me and um, I'll forward it to Dignity Alliance's uh, Legislative Committee and so we can uh, consider including it in our priority legislation. That'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let me uh, let's see here. And I've uh, provided. Um, uh, uh, Antonia, copy these slides. So she, uh, if anybody would like them, um, uh, you can uh, tame them through her. And I'm going to run through these very quickly. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the Dignity Alliance of Massachusetts is a statewide grassroots coalition um, of aging and disability service 
organizations as well as individuals. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're, we're dedicated to secure fundamental change in the provision of long-term services supporting care. We do this through um, pursuing uh, uh, public policies, uh, legislation, regulatory change. And <clears throat> the core of our work is the uh, to promote the dignity of everybody, in, um, whether they're receiving care and services or providing the care. Paul, I'm sorry, can you just start your, your presentation from the beginning? It's still on the first page. Huh. I'm not sure why it's, uh, it's on, my, on my screen, it's going. You, you see that? Yes, maybe it's just my screen, okay. No, okay, and I'm on the second page. Is that you see that? No, uh, no, I just think you need to reset and go back to slideshow and then press from beginning. Okay, let me uh, let me stop. There right. you go, there you go. Yeah, you had it. Yeah, okay, let me see. Is that working now? Yeah. Good. Yep, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, so uh, we have more than uh, 30 organizations, actually significantly more um, than that right now. And um, we're close to 250 individuals throughout the state. And this involves advocates, uh, old adults, persons with disabilities and professionals. Oh, you know what? Um, You know, I think here's, here's my, pro let me just, I'm going to end, end this. Let me just, I think what I've done here is put, um, the two, two slideshows. Okay. So, um, so we have a number of um, of work groups um, involving uh, nursing homes, home and community based services, behavioral health, um, veteran services, legislation, and, and we have a number of interest groups um, which uh, don't meet as regularly, but um, um, as needed, um, involving um, people who are incarcerated, um, whether they're older or people with um, disabilities, uh, transportation, uh, COVID assisted living. Um, and uh, diversity, equity, and outreach. Uh, some of our activities include, um, we produce a, a weekly compilation of information on aging disability um, and long-term services and supports and called the Dignity Digest. And we, we're happy to make that available to every anybody interested right now. We distribute that to about a thousand people throughout the Commonwealth, including um, um, all the legislators, a lot of people within uh, the public sector, as well as uh, individuals and advocates. Uh, we maintain a, um, a website that has a lot of uh, information uh, that's updated regularly, and that's the address, uh, dignityalliancema.org. Uh, we, um, for, right from the, our onset, uh, we have been th um, meeting um, regularly on an every week, every other week basis via Zoom. And, and uh, you know, where we initially started, we had a, about a dozen people and it indicated now that we have uh, over 200 people that we distribute the uh, agenda to. And um, our, um, our bi-weekly uh, sessions are informative and, um, and, and um, in very involved on a variety of participants. Uh, we conduct what we call um, uh, study sessions, which very similar to this session that the DA Ryan is hosting right now. We we focus on a specific um, subject matter and bringing, oops, I don't know what happened to that. Hmm. I'll bring it back up. We oh. it, it wasn't progressing. I'll bring it back up. Okay. Hmm. 
That's good. Okay. That's good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Perfect. If you could do it from your end, that'd be okay. So that that's the end of it. Okay, good. Okay, so it'll be answered, uh, Antonio. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Right. Uh, <clears throat> we um um we we interact uh, regularly with the public officials, particularly legislators. Uh, and now, um, early on, all our work was done virtually um, for the first several years, but um, more recently, we started to uh, um, be regular presence in the State House. Uh, we do a, a lot of analysis in writing and that we share through um, white papers and op-eds. Um, and we're very involved with a, a number of national advocacy groups in, in the aging and disability spectrum. Okay, next slide. Um, some of our special projects, um, we produce the dignity budget. We're working on that right now. It's a set of recommendations that we provide to initially to the governor as she prepares her budget and then to the legislative leadership as they consider the budget of uh, um, the next, uh, next year. Uh, we produced a um, set of questions uh, to candidates um, which we did both in 2022 and 2024. Um, and uh, we posted all the, the responses we received on our website. Um, <clears throat> and we conducted interviews with candidates for um, governor and um, in the various um, constitutional offices uh, two years ago. And we recently um, conduct, conducted as part of our annual rec legislative recognition um, uh, Champions of Dignity Ceremony, where we recognize um, um, legislative leadership. Uh, this year, we recognize uh, Senator Joan Lovely and uh, Representative uh, Thomas Stanley, as well as a number of legislators who were retiring from their service throughout the, their career. And, um, and we particularly um, recognize um, uh, legislative staff who uh, do a lot of the work up and you know, often go unrecognized um, and we recognize six of them. Okay. I say uh, some of our current uh, objectives is we've we're, uh, been advocating right from the beginning for single occupancy rooms in the nursing facilities uh, for both, both for the individual's uh, sense of dignity and privacy, but also, uh, especially uh, as we experienced during the uh, pandemic, the importance in terms of um, uh, public health and, and, and infection control. Um, we're, we're advocates for um, the so-called small house model of, of nursing homes. Um, 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 Margaret mentioned uh, Mary Meadows in her comments, which is um, a facility out in the Holyoke area. Um, it's um, individual rooms um, uh, clustered around a common area, um, dedicated um, staff to those um, individuals in the cluster. And the, the, the whole complex is um, um, the, the, between 12 and 14 units uh, um, uh, per uh, cluster which we think is um, a very um, um, human size um, scale instead of uh, the institutional settings that we see in, in most nursing homes today where there's 100, sometimes up to 200 people in the long corridors. Uh, we were uh, very um, involved with the recent passage of the nursing home reform bill, which is now chapter uh, 197 of the acts. And we're in, in the process of uh, having a work group um, at Dignity Alliance, uh, implementing the various provisions, um, um, analyzing that bill to make sure that the various provisions of that um, uh, law are fully enact, um, implemented. Um, we, we're very involved with frontline worker support. We're looking to expand a variety of um, housing options and accessibility. Um, we have a very active legislative uh, work group where we've endorsed over 70 bills, which we call Plus, we have 12 that we particularly highlight, which we call the Dignity Dozen, and, and we also uh, recommend uh, bills at the, at the federal level. And uh, this is a quote um, 
that uh, President Biden um, actually gave at the beginning of um, when he accepted his the nomination. Together we can and we will rebuild our economy. And when we do, we will not only build it back, we'll build it back better with elder care that makes it possible for the elderly to stay in their homes with dignity. And I think as many people know that uh, uh, the, the Biden um, administration has pursued a couple of important steps, uh, including, um, as Margaret mentioned, um, establishing uh, minimum staffing standards which for our nursing homes, which unfortunately right now is at risk of being uh, 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 repealed uh, with the new administration, as well as um, action that's being taken by uh, 20 Republican attorney generals uh, to to nullify that uh, particular provision. Um, and um, the administration has also uh, been pursuing um, expansion of um, home and community-based services that could be um, um, compensated uh, through the Medicare program. And that's something that um, Dignity Alliance has um, is embraced. Um, so we welcome everybody's um, participation um, through um, um, any of our work groups or the, the, the on a distribution list for the digest you know, or you know, for our, our call for advocacy. We will uh, uh, on a regular basis identify uh, bills of uh, uh, policy proposals or uh, re uh, regulatory um, changes um, that we s send out to all our participants participants for endorsement. A couple of our current projects are, uh, we've been advocating since, since the first of the year uh, against um, some of the, uh, of the the proposed by Mass Health to, to establish a, an independent assessment entity. Unfortunately, we've uh, been able to engage um, the leadership of Mass Health to modify uh, that appro approach. We've been very involved with um, work, um, the, uh, disability advocates and ensuring that there's no um, rollback or cuts to the, the, the PCA, uh, the personal care attendance program that keeps a lot of folks at home. And one of our other uh, particular efforts right now is to work uh, with the, the Center for Public Representation and the Greater Boston Legal Services in the uh, implementation of the, the uh, the, the class action settlement that was reached earlier this year with the um, with the Commonwealth to um, make sure that the provisions of the federal Olmstead um, um, Supreme Court decision to um, um, main, uh, to have as many people who are currently in nursing homes return to the to the community um, and um, as part of that settlement the st the state is now committed to have at least 2,400 people um, leave nursing homes over the next eight years and, and uh, return to the community with, with additional um, supports, including mo home modifications um, ho uh, and, um, or, or housing subsidies, as well as um, service plans. And uh, we're helping to uh, implement that program. And um, um, we, as, as I indicated, we welcome anybody's uh, involvement and participation. And that's our, all our contact information on the, on the uh, website now. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. We're always happy to be making good trouble. <laughs> so I want to thank our speakers today. Thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next month, and we'll hopefully have some more information about the grant and what we're doing at that point. So thank you. Be safe. Thanks, Bye -bye. Antonia. Thank you. Bye. Take care.